Hi, my name is Rob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and I'm here with Henk Urin and we're going to talk about something that you see in a lot of experiments in the Lena field and that is this black sooty compound, right? Not only black, there are many colors to see and structures and so on. The sooth is everywhere but not evenly spread, you can say, so there is a lot of things to learn probably about the sooth, why it's going to sit here and not there, and why it's being eaten later on in the process again. So there is very much going on in only this area. So <clears throat> here is a good example. So this is the Vega Valley or part of it, uh, the upper part. But when you buy the, the brass, uh, the raw brass is more brassy colored and uh, uh, even this is coated. Um, it's more like, I guess, this, uh, but it's essentially clean and polished, right, Hank? Yeah, like that. Yeah, I, I found it in, in a box, but it was shiny, like brass is. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's all these colors painted over it, you can say. And when you run an experiment, uh, you're saying these things get produced, and on the iron here, we have this white mark, and we discussed this in a previous video. But what a lot of authors have found, and Matsumoto talks about this, but before him, Yul Brown said that um, when he is transmuting heavy elements, uh, like radioactive elements, um, and he mixes with iron and aluminium to assist this process, he says that the product, and this was in, I think, 1986, the product is mostly carbon. And this was also something that was stated by Matsumoto in his book, Steps to, to the Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse. He says, mostly you get carbon. And we've observed this in a range of different experiments. The most recent author to have talked about this relative to this recording now was Anatoly Klimov. And he said that in his inflow plasma system, which is based on high-frequency, high voltage uh, Tesla coil based uh, plasma discharge system. Uh, he, when he was adding helium as a cover gas rather than argon, it doesn't happen with argon, but with helium as a cover gas, he is seeing the production of prodigious amounts of carbon. And of course, helium times three tri alpha is carbon. Now, you're not typically adding car uh, helium to your experiments, are you? No, I have a little tank with uh, to fill balloons, you know, these little tanks with helium. I bought it later to see if this has real, a real effect, but to be honest, I like my hydrogen more. It, it, it probably, and, and I get the whole carbon stuff in my tank abundantly. So, uh, now the thing is, we're, we're at the point of starting to use a spectrometer yes. where we may have already observed helium lines during some of the experiments we've done this week, but that needs to be determined later. But if you have these coherent matter structures that are both fissioning and then fusing material, you might have a scenario where you're not actually seeing the helium that is required as observed by Anatoly Klimov that is leading to the production of the carbon because the material is broken down and then emitted as carbon and in fact on the eastern valley of the Vega Valley the eastern plateau we saw one of these iron rich and iron and oxygen rich crenellated spheres and it had burst itself and it had emitted this trail of very, very high carbon rich deposit. And Solin in his 1992 patent, and it says that the nuclear reactions occur within these spherical or tubular structures. We've seen the spherical and we've seen the tubular structures as in the actual worm-like structures that you see here uh, on the Vega Valley. Um, but also, um, Matsumoto showed in his book, Steps to the Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse, actual spheres of lead and other elements with 
carbon coming from within inside these structures and coming out. And so when we are seeing these balls on here, and maybe they are consuming the copper, for instance, which is 63 nucleons and 65 nucleons, perhaps it's reducing them down to prima materia uh, or raw energy, and it's then assembling alpha particles because that's the most stable structure that has both a bosonic nature and a nature that is um, uh, uh, the most uh, efficient packing of nucleons uh, in that sort of scale of nuclei, then you are producing these subunits of these alpha particles. And within that same structure, it can either eject alpha particles, but maybe it's just more efficient because it's even more dense to have carbon produced. And so the carbon gets produced and then it gets ejected. And so you're, you're seeing carbon synthesized. You're not seeing the helium intermediary. So you have electronuclear collapse and electronuclear regeneration and then emission from the hollow sphere in the form of carbon. And the carbon is very, very fine. And it produces, in the case of the Vega Valley main channel, these unbelievably, uh, you can't find the level of nano nature to it. It's like it's, it's um, a gas of uh, carbon atoms, and then they're growing these dendritic structures. And so it's like single atoms are coming out of the carbon, and then they're either forming diamond if they're in a certain pressure domain region, or they're forming this fluffy carbon. But elsewhere in the reactor, you're seeing these kinds of things. So, Hank, maybe you can describe what, what this is and, and how it came to be so black. <laughs> yeah, well, this was one of the other experiments. And you should... This is the bottom again. What you see here is a little clean area. There was a bolt to support it. So it, it was supported on the, on, the, on, the point, on, the, on the outside, on the points. But then it will fall over, so I had to put a nut below it, a big one. So you can see the difference of the process on the side and here under, under the nut. But this is the away from the anode, so the anode is on the other side. So that was effectively upside down like that, yes. supported on, on yes. a bolt. And, when, yeah, and, and so exactly. this, this is carbon that's just assuming it is carbon, and yeah, exactly. it seems to be when you look at these things under the microscope. This is carbon that was in uh, moving around in the plasma and then gets deposited. Yes, and but the whole inside of the tank is black. The glass of the anode stem to the insulator is black. It was always black. Um, and even the top, everything is black. Um, and even li like you see here, the the the, the, the downside of this experiment and you can see black here on the side and something going on in this also this double layered structure but the dirt is deposited under this piece of uh, metal like the white stuff on uh, below the, the 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 vega valley is deposited below somewhere in the structure below the, the cathode, in the cathode, you can say. Now, what can we say that about the iron relative to the brass? Well, I've already described in a previous video how the copper, the, the zinc, the copper oxides and the zinc oxides, at least in bulk form, because there is one form of uh, copper oxide that becomes anti-ferromagnetic. But otherwise, all of these element and element oxides are diamagnetic, which means a magnetic structure will not want to uh, get too close to it. But the difference is that the iron is ferromagnetic, so a magnetic structure would want to be close to it, okay? And this would be below the, whatever it is, 760 degrees centigrade um, Curie point, one would imagine, 
I don't think you saw your reactors go to 760 degrees C. So this would be magnetic. And if you've got a magnetic structure. Now, what we have seen on the eastern valley or uh, eastern plateau of the Vega Valley is these fractal toroidal structures. And they are almost entirely calcium oxide. Now, is it because it went through the crack of, of the Vega Valley and just got trapped in between that we see them there in the Eastern Plateau, but they wouldn't ordinarily be there because they would like to move away from all these diamagnetic materials. But in the case of the iron, these structures, let's say, if they are magnetic, they get bound to the surface. Yeah. And, you know, it might be that... Uh, they collapse and you don't see the physical form of the crystal of calcium oxide or calcium uh, because the coherent matter collapses but its substructures as they're in this cascade of collapse deposit the, the, the calcium or calcium oxide as a thin layer whereas where it's trapped every single fractal of the structure that's collapsing in the Vega Valley for instance in the eastern plateau there it is collapsing in such a way that it, it um it still doesn't want to fall apart and become part of the uh the magnetic structure it's kind of held so it's kind of prevented from losing its overall form as it becomes normal ordinary matter so that's a hypothesis for why we see the difference obviously it needs to be confirmed what this white deposit here is um and if it is calcium then that that and it doesn't have these toroidal fractal structures then i think that that would be an interesting outcome to observe so yeah it it's very interesting that you're not seeing i mean there is a little bit of the white deposit here but i would imagine that that is somewhere where you probably had a piece of ferromagnetic material the, uh, for instance this bolt this is and and the this the side of the tank um, i mean the tank is so, right, so you're saying this is potentially a soft iron bolt, so it would be yeah. ferromagnetic. Yeah. And that this is potentially... The side of the tank. Okay. Because it, it, this is the, the tank supported this. Right. So the, the, the end point is the tank. Okay, so that would kind of fit, because we've got less deposit of carbon here, and one might imagine that for whatever reason... So... Oh, well, there is a band also. There is something yeah. going on here. There's more. There's a band... Well, so there's one band here. And one, you know what? It, it, this could be um, paramagnetic pyrolytic carbon. Because if you want... If you've ever seen those experiments where you get these neodymium magnets and you get this pyrolytic carbon sheet and it floats above it because it's, it's pretty much the thing that's only... It, it's the only thing that's it's similar or, or as intense diamagnetic nature as... Uh, bismuth but of course it's much much lighter than bismuth so it might be the case that the the carbon is diamagnetic and so it doesn't mind depositing on the brass because that's also diamagnetic there isn't that interaction there but it, 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 it you know maybe it, the but, calcium is magnetic because the cluster structure is magnetic and so it does deposit on the iron the, the interesting questions and theories and that's that's what so going on. now what i'm seeing here i have to say this hank uh i don't know if people can see this i'm going to zoom right in but there is a structure here on this tip if i can find it i'm zooming there right there is a structure here that is you can see here it's very small i'm going to zoom out so you can get an overall impression you see that little black spot with a white spot around it this is the piece I want. I, I want Hank to cut off. I want. I want uh, him to cut this section off. I'm wondering if that wasn't one of these iron-rich crenellated spheres that hit there. It may not be there right now, but it might be. And because after it collapsed, it is highly magnetic. It was able to pull in these uh, clusters of calcium oxide, which are themselves are magnetic, and overcome. The diamagnetic repulsion yeah. of the brass and uh, the constituent element oxides, which are all diamagnetic. So this, yeah. for me, is the, the most interesting, followed by these observations where, where it's near the iron, you have less carbon deposit on either side of the structure. 
and where there are bits of iron or ferromagnetic material, yeah. you see these white deposits. And what I can tell also is that I can't remember in this case, but very often in these corners you have this hiding principle again, so sometimes the plasma tends to go on the outside where you don't expect it to go, but it wants to go there. And then you get maybe these structures as well. There is more activity going on sometimes, especially on these strange places outside. And that is maybe the reason why there's also a band going on, because this black mm -hmm. strip yeah, is, yeah. Is, is, is a strange structure. And that can be uh, the result of activity, plasma activity going on. So and and could it just all be down to this whole this whole re crack based resonant yes phenomenon? It's my theory that it yes and and and, and probably in the old likes to go there because things are happening there and when there is a micro cluster there collapsing, the anode we can see in the in in the in the films of yesterday they like to start to focus on that kind of spots, so when somewhere in the tank a um, phenomena happens where these massive electron ejections occur then the anode wants to go there focus there and then you get a process going on in that area for a short while maybe but still when it happens very often you can maybe get these kind of structures on the outside so i, I brought a book for you to have a look at whilst i'm here which was the main reference of Ken Shoulders when he was starting to look at John Hutchison and it's a vacuum arcs book and if you look at the equipment in there you will very very often see very carefully curved structures uh, as maybe spark suppressors or whatever and you can imagine with what we're learning and seeing here that um you know if you ha if you want to initiate a spark you have a very fine point ideally a taylor, taylor cone that comes up to one single atom and if you don't want to initiate a spark you do what tesla did which john hutchison did which is you create something with a minimum surface curvature like a sphere or a torrid or a capsule that is how should we put this? Like a pill shape, like a tic tac shape, yeah. So we're in these uh, electrodes in that book. You will see a lot of these very carefully minimum surface curvature structures. And what we're doing here is we're forcing high levels of curvature and high levels of cracks. So something that they have worked on so hard to avoid damage of electrodes. We're actually doing the opposite in these experiments. We're trying to enhance the damage. And the answer is, I believe, the opposite of the solution to producing long-lived electrodes. Yeah, right. And But I think uh, the, the irony is you can polish it as much as you like, but on an atomic level, you will always have a crack somewhere. And then it starts and then it eats your electrodes away and, and that's what we found with your copper pipe wasn't it when we looked at it in the microscope we found that between the crystal grains it was starting to initiate ball lightning structures and they were growing and converting the copper into carbon with a little hole at the top where you had these hollow chambers which were spewing must have been spewing out the carbon that they were synthesizing yeah. and so uh yeah what you would want ideally is a material if you didn't want your electrodes to break down, that was a single crystal which had perfect minimum surface curvature. That's a difficult thing to produce. Ideally, it would want to be a glassy metal. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the reason why they start to use mercury as a cathode, because it's healing itself yeah. automatically. And that's exactly what the, that, that's what they do in tokamaks more recently, to have the self-healing walls of the tokamak wall. Yeah. Uh, and because the tungsten isn't able to withstand no. whatever's going on. We can see that tungsten likes to be eaten. Yeah. And uh, that that MEHPL, the Moscow Nuclear Physics Laboratory, they have this flower of life, as I call it, uh, which they call a unipolar arc, where it's converted the tungsten into this snowflake of carbon. And the snowflake is on all the switches in the world with 
physical of with, with hard stuff. Yeah, um, and 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 you're looking at these snowflakes on these samples. Uh, this is kind of like a snowflake, but fr coming from the edge. If you imagine that was radiating out from a point, you would have a similar structure to that which you see on that unipolar arc in that tungsten tokamak wall structure. So this self-healing process, it's actually what Tesla used in his 1932 uh, uh, particles of electric matter emitter. Um, and the Ken Shoulders patents of the self-healing wetted tungsten tip electrode uh, and it was wetted with mercury. And so it's something that, because of its surface tension and because of its amorphous nature, is able to produce exactly what I described, a non-crystalline structure that uh, is conductive and uh, automatically defaults to minimum surface curvature. It's basically the option you have, <laughs> really, right? I mean, unless you get gallium and you make that into a liquid or you... you turn metals into liquid you don't have other options really um maybe you can make some glassy silicon i don't know like like the glass bead of the tesla uh carbon arc light bulb it was carbon but sorry carbon button light bulb which actually was um carborundrum which was uh silicon carbide i think most of them but uh, I, I think in the end you are not able to make a, a, a normal switch in life that will not be eaten by this process. It always be eaten, so you have to have a system that you can easily change your parts so you can renew the switch because it always will be eaten. And, and, and we were discussing this the other day, that, weren't that's we? Life, that's life, we have yeah. to live with it. And you cannot make, you better design a switch that can be uh, changed the components very quickly, then try to make it not burn because that will not be possible. That's what we can see here.